In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Wondrous is God in His saints, so says the Scriptures. And each day throughout the year, we in the church keep the memory of those saints who departed from this life and entered into their heavenly rest on that given day. We do so by singing their hymns, by serving the divine liturgy in their memory, by reading archivists to them, kissing their icons, reverencing their relics. <clears throat> and one of the most important things we do is to hear the lives of the saints so that we might seek to embody what they did in their lives within ourselves. We might learn from them how we too can achieve to holiness. But today we celebrate the great eruption of holiness that took place throughout all the world with the descent of the Holy Spirit, the feast of all saints. For like the holy prophet Isaiah says in the scriptures, just as the rain comes down and the snows from heaven and does not return back, but waters the earth and makes it to bring forth into bud and to give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. In like manner, when the Holy Spirit has come down and waters the earth with grace, it makes it bring forth and bud with the radiant lives and flowers of holiness in every corner of all the earth. And so then on this first Sunday after Pentecost, after the descent of the Holy Spirit from heaven, after his taking up abode in the hearts of men and women, the Holy Church gathers together, as it were, the fragrant flowers of sanctity and piety, the glorious saints who have shone forth in every time and place, and presents them to us, as it were, in a great bouquet of sanctity. The crown of this holy assembly is the Holy Mother of God, higher than all the angelic hosts, seated at the right hand of her Son in heaven. Next, the holy prophets and righteous ones of the Old Testament, who longed for and foretold the coming of Christ. The all-praised apostles of Christ and their successors, our fathers among the saints, the hierarchs, who have proclaimed to us the word of truth and have administered to us the life-giving sacraments, making us members of the body of Christ. The all-glorious confessors of the faith and holy great martyrs, who suffered and even died, rather than compromise the faith that had been entrusted once to the saints. The venerable ascetics, holy men and women who suffered in monasticism and struggled boldly against their sinful temptations and having overcome them in themselves have become a witness to us that we can do the same and have given us instructions on how to do so. The right believing kings and queens, princes and princesses who not only governed their subjects well but ruled themselves according to the life-giving commandments of Christ. And the countless holy men and women, the righteous ones, old and young, lettered and unlettered, rich and poor, married and chaste, who have shown forth in all the world and have shown to us that while there is only one true way to God, that is, Jesus Christ and in his church, within the church, there are many paths, countless paths, by which we may work out our salvation, by which we may struggle to find our way to God. And so, as we said, then the church holds before us this day, then this beautiful bouquet, the radiant flowers of the saints who have shone forth from all times, and allows us to come forth and to admire the various forms and shapes and colors of the flowers and to take in deeply inhaling the beautiful aroma of grace that has spread forth from each and every one of them. And most importantly, we do this not simply as spectators, but hoping to catch the grace that they had to learn from them how we too may be numbered among their holy band. And so when we hear the lives of the saints, we often are moved to marvel at their glorious deeds, their ascetic feats, some the, the stylites who sta stood on pillars in sun and rain and snow and all the, all the, the forces of, of the weather against them, and yet they stood valiantly 
and, and fought against the demons, gave instruction to people, such you know, extreme forms of asceticism, the evangelism of others that would travel around the world to preach the gospel to those who had not heard it, the miracles that some performed, healings, raising the dead, either in life or, as we hear often, of the intercession to saints and even after their death, how they still perform miracles, their works of charity and selflessness, giving everything that they had for those that were in need, their humility and their love, their personal struggle with their temptations, the temptations that they faced and how they overcame them, and in some of the more extreme cases, their very confession and martyrdom for the sake of the faith. And in reading these things and hearing these things, sometimes while we may marvel at them, we might become tempted to either say, well, that's interesting to look at, that's interesting to hear about, but I could never do that. We may even become overwhelmed or led into a sort of despair. Well, what will I do? I've never performed any miracles. I'm not a monastic. I can hardly stay at peace with my friends and my families and my co-workers. How, how will I ever achieve salvation? Well, hear what the word of Christ is this day, what it is that he told his disciples and tells us through them. He said, whoever will confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whoever will deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Now do you see then, he boils things down for us today to simply making a good confession of our faith. Now by confessing our faith here, he does not simply mean to stand up and to say the creed, though we do that time and time again in the church, so that if we were ever called upon to make a good confession of our faith, if someone were to call us to deny our faith, we know what it is that we believe and we will stand for it. But first, as St. Gregory Palamas points out, we are to confess Christ, and we are to confess, the wording is, if we confess in him, he will acknowledge what is in us, belief in him, a union with him through our baptism, a life shared in communion with him. But if we deny Christ, then God, <clears throat> then Christ will look upon us, and there will be nothing in us for him to acknowledge. Nothing, no fruit of grace, no sign of the mercy that he has poured out for us. And how does this come about, though, in our lives? When, when are we tempted to confess or to deny Christ? How many times are we told to simply, no, oh, don't worry about what your faith teaches about X, Y, Z. The times have changed. We think differently now. And we're told to, to question and to challenge what the church teaches. Or in our personal lives, we confess Christ every time we live a life of selflessness, of love, of dedication to God, of caring for those around us. This is the confession of Christ. But we deny him every time we turn a cold shoulder. We become angry with those around us. We have a cold heart. We can think of countless examples in our life where we are called upon to confess Christ, not simply with our lips, but in our lives. Because when Christ called us to believe in him, he did not mean simply to believe that he had done something for us, but to put our trust in him and to follow the teachings that he gave us. So every time we fulfill the commandments of Christ, to love our neighbor, to turn the other cheek, to struggle against the lust of the eyes, to struggle against anger, to struggle against greed, to struggle against despondency. Each and every time we do that, we are confessing belief in Christ because we believe in him and therefore are trying to put into practice what he has taught us to do. But every single time that we decide, oh, it doesn't matter, I'll just do it the way I want to, or these are just old-fashioned rules, these sorts of things. In each and every one of those instances, we deny Christ. I want to tell you the example of a life of a saint who is a perfect example of this confession for us. 
who was commemorated this past week, St. John the Russian. Just a little audience interaction here. By a show of hands, who knows the life of St. John the Russian? Okay, a few of you. So I won't be repeating it for all of you then. It'd be a new story for some. St. John the Russian was a saint who was born in Ukraine in the year 1690. He grew up in a very pious Orthodox family there. And when he was a young man, he was enrolled in the military under Peter the Great, Tsar Peter the Great. And he was sent off to fight in the Turco-Russian War that took place in the year 1710 to 1711. And while he was there, probably one of the worst things that anyone could imagine happened to him. We think the best case scenario is to go off to battle and to come back alive. The worst case scenario may be to die on the battlefield, but worse than that is probably to be taken a prisoner of war, and especially by forces that will not respect your humanity. And so St. John was taken as a prisoner of war by the Muslim Turks. And in time, he was sold into slavery to one of the officers of the cavalry that he had been fighting against. And surely, if you know anything about the history of the Christians under the Turks, they lived as second-class citizens. They were a dimi, a subjected people who had to pay high taxes. They couldn't hold certain positions in society. They had to wear clothing that showed that they were Christians, not the more elevated Turks. And in so many ways, the world around them made it difficult for them just to live their lives as Christians. It's a great martyrdom, living martyrdom, living confession of the faith that all the Christians lived under that. But imagine not only being the people that lived in those lands, but to have been an invading army that was fighting against them how they would have treated him. And so his master would berate him, would yell at him, would tell him he should convert to Islam, would beat him, would mistreat him. And many of his companions who were also captured gave in. They would make things easier for themselves. They'd be more comfortable if they just went along with what the world was asking of them. And so they accepted the Muslim faith. But St. John the Russian would not. And he said to his master, You cannot turn me from the holy faith by your threats, nor with your promises of riches and pleasures. I will obey your orders willingly if you will leave me free to follow my religion. I would rather surrender my head to you than to change my faith. I was born a Christian, and I shall die a Christian. This is the resolution that we must have in the face of the world around us. This is the resolution that we must have in the face not only of the world around us, but the temptations that come to us. We should say these very words when temptations come to us and ask us in our actions to deny Christ when we wish to confess him and say, I was born a Christian, I will die a Christian. And so St. John the Russian eventually was sort of left alone by his master. And so he was able to live his life in piety, though under very difficult circumstances. He lived in the stable of his master with the horses. He made a little bed for himself in the corner in the hay. And while he was there, he didn't sit there and grumble to himself, Oh God, if you were really God, why have you allowed these things to come upon me? Instead, he spent his time in prayer. And he didn't say, I have things so tough, I don't have to care about the people around me. They can fend for themselves. He took what meager means he had and would give them to the poor, those that were in greater need than himself. He didn't say, well, God has abandoned me. Look at these difficult things that have come upon me. So I'm going to abandon him. But he was regularly in the church for the feast days, for the services on the weekends. And he fulfilled that word that he spoke to his master that day. Because as he neared the end of his life, he called to the priest. He wanted to receive the mysteries one last time before he died. And he couldn't rise from his bed. And the priest was afraid to bring the Holy Communion into the house of the Muslim. And so he hid it in an apple. And he sent it into him. And he was able to take the body and blood of Christ one last time. One last time to confess, I believe, O Lord, and I confess 
that this is truly your body, truly your blood, and to receive him and to then say, let your servant depart in peace. He died a Christian. And so, brothers and sisters, are we called to know that we live as Christians and we are to die as Christians and to hold that up against anything that would pull us away from Christ. So then, we should use this great and holy day, this feast of all the saints, to focus on the specific characteristics of each and every one of the saints. This is what we ought to do throughout the year as we have the days dedicated to them. Learn how to pray from those that excelled in prayer. Learn how to fast from those that excelled in fasting. Learn how to love your families from those that were good husbands and wives and children. Learn how to be good Christians from those that lived as Christians in the world. Learn the virtues of each and every one of them. And use these days to distance yourself from your sins, from your passions, from your temptations. And then we can heed the words that St. Paul spoke to us in the epistle reading today. After talking of all the saints who had suffered so much, either anticipation of Christ or after his coming. And he told us, Therefore, seeing that we are circled about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us therefore lay aside every weight, the sin that so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God on high. If you will confess Christ, if you will follow him, if you will take up your cross and live in the footsteps that he laid before you, then we too will be numbered in that great array of all the saints that we celebrate this day, who are gathered about the throne of God, who sing continually his praises and are calling and bidding us to come and join them this day. Amen.